Hey everybody, welcome back to Challenge Athletes Live. My name is Bob Babbitt, one of the co-founders of Challenge Athletes Foundation. Our next guest, really a gentleman I've been looking forward to chatting with for a long time. His name is Chris Rudin, and he was born missing uh, with two fingers on his left hand, a short left arm, and became uh, a great power lifter, among other things. Chris, thanks so much for taking time and coming on. Thank you guys for having me, honestly. Like, I'm super excited to talk to you. I'm super excited in the midst of where we are right now to be able to you know, just kind of talk about these things. So thank you again for having me. No problem. And so take me back. So you, you have a birth defect, you're missing a couple fingers and you got a short arm, but early on, it seemed like you were okay with that. You're, but when did it get to the point where you felt like, you know what, I, I need to hide my hand. I don't, I don't want, I don't want to own this. So growing up with a limb difference, everyone has different experiences. I didn't get a prosthetic until two years ago, you know? Up until that point, I just knew that I was different, but I always adapted, you know, and my parents were pretty supportive, but here and there, kids would say things. They would look, they would point, they would like, you know, all, all kinds of stuff, but that never really bothered me. It wasn't until I switched schools until I stopped going to a very small school where we had literally 14 people in three grades. It was a tiny school, you know? Yeah. Um, I went to a different school and I realized like, wow, I'm different and different is not good. So there was this girl named Crystal who was the prettiest girl in my class. Um, I was young at the time, I was in middle school, maybe 12, 13. Yeah. And uh, to be fair, there was like seven girls, but this girl was the prettiest. And uh, I finally worked up the courage to talk to her. And I went up to her in front of the middle of the room. I'll never forget. My friends started laughing. I looked back and I was like, guys, you're gonna ruin this, stop. And I looked back and she's making fun of my two fingers with a stapler calling me claw boy. That, that was the beginning that I started shoving my hand in my pocket to the point where if I put my backpack on and I put my hand in my pocket, I would ask to go to the bathroom so that I could take my backpack off or I'd keep my backpack on for the rest of the day because I refused to take my hand out of my pocket just to get my backpack off. So it was, I, I went through a little bit different in the mental side of things. A lot of people see me now with muscles, tattoos, cool, all that, but the mental health part of it was the biggest deciding factor for my prosthetic arm. And I was almost afraid to admit that for a long time because I felt guilty. I was like, well, I should be confident. I should be. And that was my problem is I told myself all these things that I should be instead of acknowledging what I was and what I needed to do to fix it. And when I finally accepted that, man, life changed. And when did you accept it? Two years ago. For Just seven two years ago. Two years so ago. Was there sport in your life at all? Up until then? So it, honestly, it wasn't until I got another condition. I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, autoimmune yep. disease, and we are in National Diabetes Awareness Month. Um, I started making changes. I was like, I can't be this diabetic, disabled, broken kid. I can't be labeled this, this thing that is just not good, you know? So I started working out to take care of my health, which I noticed, oh, I had to adapt, you know, machines. I'm a one-handed guy living in a two-handed world. It's not really working. So I was like, I have to adapt. I started learning like, oh, I could do this. I could do that. And I was like, okay, instead of being a lawyer, because I love arguing with people, maybe I should do something more effective and get into exercise science. I got my degree in exercise science. And I started really looking into like biomechanics and how people with limb differences or cognitive neurological dysfunctions, you know, operate. I started training a kid with cerebral palsy who couldn't really walk or talk. And I fell in love with this kid, this 11 year old named David. And I would like literally grab him and I'd help kick the ball and he'd be so excited he would fall and he'd get back up. And like, he taught me so much about life in general. And that's when I knew fitness was a, a huge component. I found weightlifting because people told me I couldn't, I'm super stubborn. And I developed an apparatus, like a hook apparatus. And I just attached it about around my residual limb and I lifted 135 pounds. I was like, man, that's so cool. But I was like, there's no way I could go heavier. And then I hit 225 and then 315, and then 405, and then 495, and 585. And then I pulled 645 pounds in front of 20,000 people. You know, those limiting beliefs were broken at every step just because I decided that like, okay, I have to find a different way. I can't keep following what everyone else is doing. I have to find a different way. And I found that different way. And it was through accepting who I was and who I was not. I am not a person who's just disabled. I'm a person who happens to have a difference and I can adapt around it. And the deal is that all of us have differences. 100%. Just, 
is visual, right? People can yeah. see it. And, yeah. and at the same time, because they can see it, it, it you, can, you can lead with that or you can hide it. And yeah. when you lead with it, like when you got your prosthetic hand, it, I noticed that it's black. Yeah. And I'm sure that it could have been flesh colored. It could yes, have been- that was, that was a huge deciding factor. Like I, I, they asked if I wanted that flash color hand and I said no, because I was hiding for so long. You know, I made a video, my coming out video of like, hey, this is my disability. I took my glove off because, you know, I, I had a glove for 17 years and I took it off and I posted it on YouTube. For me, that was like jumping in the deep end. You know, I was like, maybe a few people will see it. That'll be cool. Seven million views later on YouTube, Washington Post picks it up. It's everywhere. I'm like, oh God, oh my God. But that was the best thing ever because it forced me into the comfort zone that I wanted to be in, you know? And, and I, I've, li I've broken world records, powerlifting, all this. But the, the hardest thing and the, the biggest thing I've ever done was walk into Walmart without a glove on. Like not even Target. I'm not talking about a fancy store. Walmart of all places. And I was ecstatic to be like, I can comfortably go buy groceries without hiding my hand. And that for me was the biggest moment in my life. I love that. So I, I, I've watched your motivational speech and you're wearing underpants on the outside. Oh, yeah. That's one of my talks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and basically you felt like you were going through life with underpants on the outside of your pants. I thought that was such a great way for people to reflect on what you were dealing with. I had to find a way to, not everyone has a, a visual disability. Like even right now, I don't know if you can see on here, but I'm watching my blood sugar like constantly through my phone. You know, people can't see the diabetes. They don't really see that. Right. But everyone has, like you said, some sort of struggle. People happen to see the, the disability. But for me to give that visual representation of what it feels like, those underpants, you know, sometimes you feel like your pants are on backwards or you, you mistakenly did something weird, your shirt's inside out that feeling that you get like that snap feeling of oh my god i felt that every minute of every day and my disability didn't change it like i had to accept myself some people are fortunate enough to accept themselves sooner than others and i almost felt jealousy when i met people who accepted themselves sooner but then i realized like we all have a different process a different right. journey and as long as we have a community like caf or anyone who supports that I grew the most when I allowed myself to go into a community like this. What, what I love is when you're picking a sport for somebody who's got a limb difference, you could be playing soccer, right? Your, your hand won't affect you there. You can, you can find sports where the hand is not an issue. When you're talking about powerlifting and lifting <laughs> 655 pounds. That is going to be a big it's an issue, right? 100%. Yeah. And was, was that a conscious decision? I need to pick a sport that I really shouldn't be doing just because I need to, I need to challenge myself. I think uh, I was never the conventional guy in sports. Like people look at me, they see the muscles and stuff. Everyone assumes military one. We already know there's a stigma behind that, but um, people assume that I, I was a jock. I was the biggest nerd. I was president of the chess club. I used to decorate cakes. I love decorating cakes. Like I did, ever, I don't even know where the ball is. I got my degree in exercise science and I'm the only guy who didn't like sports. I loved unconventional sports like mixed martial arts or lifting. I wanted bodybuilding, you know, anything like that. That to me, it was so impossible, so hard to do. And with powerlifting, I just found that I was getting stronger and I found ways to make it work. And I, it's just something I love to be able to lift a weight that you couldn't lift the week before. Yes. The progress is addicting in any aspect of life. And for me, that is my therapy. That's my, that's what I choose to do. But whether your sport is, you know, basketball or rowing or whether you just like gardening, it doesn't matter. Like as long as you find something that gives you that satisfaction and effort that you can put in every day and say, Hey, I did this to me. I support that. The, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the young boy with CP who you started working with when he was 11. And at that point he could barely walk. Uh -huh. A year later, he ran on the beach for the first time. Yeah. I, I, just from our brief conversation, I can tell that that means way more to you than any amount of weightlifting you've done. A hundred percent. So that, that kid was, not only was that awesome for him and his family loved that, and that was such a cool experience for me to be able to be a part of that, you know, but that taught me that there is possibility outside of the norm. 
because with him, I didn't treat him like patient 47. I didn't treat him like CP or the CP kid. I treated him like David, how I've always wanted to be treated like Chris, not the kid with the disability, not the kid with diabetes, Chris. And I feel like until we start to treat people that way, until we start to feel, treat ourselves that way, as more than our, our differences, we won't be able to reach that level of, of happiness and quality of life. When did you get connected with Challenge Athletes Foundation? So everything happened so quickly. I, I released that video of me coming out and being open about my disability. And then somehow I got connected with TV show with the rock uh, Titan games. I did. Yes. Titan. And then I took a trip to Africa to speak about diabetes. I came back, I got connected with Zappos adaptive. Um, I started doing stuff with Zappos adaptive and then I got connected with CEF and did an event for CEF and I fell in love with them. And I'm just like that whole year was just, it was so overwhelming in the sense of it was the community I never knew I needed, but always yeah. wanted, you know? I love that. So for you, when your first motivational speech, I'm, I'm guessing had to be pretty damn scary. The first time you got up in front of a group. My first motivational speech, I was still hiding my disability. That was two and a half years ago, three years ago. Really? Uh, yeah. And I started speaking knowing that it was okay to discuss problems on a peer level, knowing that I still need to work on things, but I can still help. My concept was you teach best what you need to learn most. And with that, I knew the things that I was actively working through and I would help people, but I still struggled. And it was still tough every day to get in front of a group and say, this is me, I'm still not fully comfortable, but I'm here in my most peer form, you know? I got invited to speak at an event. Uh, that was my dream job. If you look at like the secret question, yes. you know, it was your dream job. And I put speaker because I thought it, that just wasn't a reality. You know, I got invited to do an event, a nonprofit event. I spoke at it and everyone was like, that was amazing. I took that opportunity to spend a year learning how to improve my speaking. And now I do that full time as a real career. And my parents were like, so you used to get in trouble for speaking in school and now you get paid to speak. How does that work? And it's so crazy to come full circle, you know, like, hey, I made it work. So what are the goals in terms of lifting? Uh, you, you still have some goals out there you want to reach? So I recently uh, broke another unofficial world record. I did 675 pounds. Um, I'm on track to go to 700 pounds. And I'm doing my first bodybuilding competition, which is huge for me. The aesthetics are cool, but I was so judgy of my own body for so mm -hmm. long, like body image issues. And to be able to go on a stage and say, like, I'm proud of what I've built for me is the most, I don't care if I get last place. I don't care if there's one person for me, it's being able to go on a stage and allow people to judge me when I was so scared of judging myself. That's a huge goal for me. And for the rest of my life, I want to lift weights, power lift. That's fun. But I want to continue speaking. I'm doing exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I'll be completely happy. In terms of your prosthetic hand, how has that, I've talked to a number of people with I'll get a, Edward Gar, Eduardo Garcia is one of our guys who's a chef and lost yeah. his arm balloon. And he used his prosthetic for a little while, then he went back to his hook because it was easier yeah. to hook with. What, how often do you use it? And is it something you're, you feel like it was the right move? So I feel like it was the best move mentally. Um, I've realized that with diabetes, there's a lot of issues with costs and stuff like that. Prosthetics are a whole nother animal, you know? Um, the, this thing is not, I'm not a dainty person. I'm a very clumsy person. I run into everything. So it's broken a lot. And unfortunately right now I'm at a standstill with like insurance and costs and all that. There's eventual moves I wanna make with a new arm, but right now it's more of like a, a mental thing than a physical. Everything that we've built to try and build a workout arm for myself has broken. So the only thing that's held up is my original design that's just like a hook. Yeah. So eventually I'll continue work on that. But I think the arm was a stepping stone to a, a mental level where I can be comfortable with or without it. And that's what I'm most thankful for. I love it. Well, we're thankful to have you part of our Challenge Athletes Foundation family. I appreciate all that you guys have done, not only like for me, mentally, physically, events, but for everything you're doing for the people that are coming up, maybe just like me. So this goes way beyond just a, a cool company or cool people. It's the real impact that I wish I had growing up, you know? 
one of my favorite stories is we had a, a guy who was a two-time Ironman world champion named Chris McCormick who came out to our triathlon one year and is seeing a 150 challenge athletes all over the place. He's like, I need to bring my girls here. They need to see this. So his girls came the following year and we got all of our kids out there playing. And Chris's daughter's mom says, honey, why don't you go play with the other kids? And you'll love this. She goes, I can't play with them. I don't have a magic leg like they do, right? <laughs> I love how the world has changed and people don't look at this as a limb difference is a problem. The kids got, you know, they've got Scooby-Doo, they've got Spider-Man painted on their legs. A hundred percent. Right? It makes, it makes you different in a good way. But it's not just kids either. So when I first met Challenge Athletes Foundation, I was at the Zappos Adaptive uh, Fashion Show with Runway of Dreams in Vegas. And it was the first time I've ever been around people like me with a, a prosthetic arm. And it was people I've talked to online, specifically this girl, Angel, and this guy, yep. Kid Chase. Um, they don't even know this story. So if they watch this, they're going to lose their mind. But I was hiding my hand until I met them and saw how comfortable they were. And it wasn't until I was around them for a few minutes or well, a few hours where I saw them not hiding and like just taking their prosthetic off. I'm like, you can do that. I'm like, you don't feel weird. And in my head, I pretended like I was cool. I'm like, oh yeah, this is normal. I was dying. I was dying inside. But it wasn't until I submerged myself in that environment. And I was like, wow, this is okay. This is good. Wow. I like this a lot. You know, so that day, the day I met you guys, the day I did all that, that day was a pivotal moment for me mentally. Love it. Hey, Chris, thanks for taking time and joining us on Challenge Athletes Live. It was really a pleasure to get to meet you. Pleasure to talk to you. Chris Rudin has been our guest, everybody. Challenge Athletes Live. My name is Bob Babbitt. Check us out next time. Thanks so much for tuning in.